about to enter a whole new era with peak oil. Petroleum geologists predict at some point between 2006 and 2010, we will pass the planetary peak oil spike. And from then on, with every year, there will be less and less net energy available to humankind, no matter what we do. And this is, I believe, an epoch of such enormity that to make any meaningful comparison at all, you've got to go back to the Mayans, to the Romans, and the collapse of the last complex civilizations. Because those civilizations, they didn't collapse just because people got bored of being Mayans and Romans. The high priest didn't come out onto the temple steps at Chichen Itza one solstice giving it Oh, this is bollocks, isn't it? What an idea. And the Roman Empire didn't end just because they got bored of being Romans. In the last days of Rome, you were only about 30 people showing up at the Colosseum and their gladiators' hearts weren't in it. And they're like... <laughs> Even the lions are bored. <laughs> Most of the gladiators ended up playing Gaylord tennis. <laughs> but the scoring was fiendishly difficult because the hot Italian sun made perspiration inevitable, no matter the sang froid of the individual dandy racketeer. Those civilizations collapsed because their strategies for energy capture became subject to the law of diminishing returns. Now, there's a brilliant book out in a minute about peak oil called The Party's Over, Oil War and the Fate of Industrial Societies, although I sometimes suspect that it's because my own life is so empty that I'm powerfully attracted to a book whose title is The Party's Over. <laughs> Yeah, Jude Law, swanning around the globe with all your actress girlfriends. Well, I'm afraid to have to tell you the party's over. <laughs> and all you young people driving away in the nightclub discotheques, going home and having free love, excuse me while I take the needle off the record. <laughs> the party's over. And Richard Heinberg, who wrote The Party's Over, his thesis is, look, the name we gave to the world that first coal and then oil made is industrial society. When we pass the peak oil spike and oil depletes rapidly, it is the collapse of industrial society. And that faced with this enormous fact, this elephant in the room, humans are in denial, looking as ever for the quick techno fix. But there is no way out. Not this time, but we are suckers and we need to believe like the victims of every contract ever played. We need to believe, but there is no way. Well, we run out of oil, we go to the hydrogen economy, but there are no hydrogen reservoirs. Beneath the Thames Valley, you make hydrogen fuel cells from fossil fuel cells. You can use hydrogen fuel cells to store wave and wind. It's not useless, but it's not an energy source. It's an energy carrier. No way out. Well, we run out of oil, we go to the nuclear option. Well, apart from everything else is the small matter. That from mining to decommissioning, the nuclear cycle as a whole produces 75% as much carbon emissions as coal-fired gas stations, non-starter. No way out! I don't want to bum you out totally. There are some hopeful technologies, credit where it's due. I mean, not enough people are investing in these technologies, but, okay, they're there. If you must have cars in the future, they can be powered by zinc air fuel cells, uh, which produce a non-toxic byproduct, zinc oxide, which is a kind of viscous, thick, creamy white substance, which can be recycled into fresh zinc fuel pellets using electrolysis and walnut oil. And the catalyst that they're developing at Stanford University is thermobroma cacao, or coca solids. So the car of the future will drive along powered by zinc air fuel cells, and out the back, on a little tray, will be produced a row of this thick, creamy white substance surrounded by a chocolate whirl with a walnut on the top. <laughs> there is no way out. <laughs> and transport is the least of our concerns. There is the small matter of the oil we eat. Since the 1960s, food is oil. In 1944, the average American farm produced 2,300 calories of food energy for every calorie of fossil fuel energy went into the field. In 
1974, historically, that ratio became one to one. In our own time, thanks to nitrogen fertilizers, oil-based pesticides, refrigeration and four-figure food miles, it's 2,000 to one reverse. So you'd think, wouldn't you? The lead item on every news show every night would be, how are we going to feed ourselves now that the oil is running out? a very timely book out at the minute called Who Will Feed China? Wake Up Called for a Small Planet. Although personally I think they're asking the wrong question. The question should of course be when will feed China? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to feed South America? Who's going to feed Europe? Big questions no one's asking. There's only one place I know on this planet doing any research into this. The Ecology Institute in Willits, California. And their statistical modelling starts on the assumption that there will be 7.5 billion of us on this planet in the middle of the 21st century. Okay, this being so, they ask, what then is the minimum amount of land per person we would need to devote to agriculture to support a population that size? And the figure they come up with, 2,800 square foot per person. Doable. I should say, however, that there Statistics are based on a strictly vegan diet, biointensive farming, and the composting of all plant and human waste, including post-mortem humans. A somewhat skanky concept at first, I'll grant you. But I think in time it could develop its own dignity and gravitas, especially if the rich and famous lead the way. A year from now, you go into the Vatican Garden, and there's one of the cardinals standing next to a huge cylindrical composting drum saying, well, it's a year now since Pope John Paul II sadly passed away. So let's give him a turn. <laughs> oh, look at that. He's mulched up lovely for a tough, leathery old bird. <laughs> let's spread this rich biomass over the cabbages and beetroot so beloved in his native homeland. Oh, Glasgow Rangers tattoo. He kept that quiet. <laughs> and I ain't talking about something that may happen at some point in the future one day. The most every country that ever produced oil has already had the big rollover, already passed its peak of domestic oil production. Colombia, 2004. Britain, 2002. Venezuela, 2000. Trinidad and Tobago, 1977. Iran, 76. And the USA, 1970. Three years later, the House Subcommittee on Foreign Relations publishes a report called Oil Fields as Military Objectives, a Feasibility Study, now known as an American plan to bring democracy to the Middle East. But I ain't saying the Americans is more evil than anybody else because they ain't. They just got the capability. I have no doubt, for example, that in 1977, Trinidad commissioned its own report called Oil Fields as Military Objectives. Tell us, what is the full strength of our Navy? Would that be including jet skis, sir? <laughs> And of course, catch, 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 22 is the very worst fate that could befall humanity and all the other little species is the discovery of huge new reserves of oil beneath the tundra or the burning into the sky of what's already known about because the climate chaos that would unleash would make the mere collapse of industrial society a sideshow bagatelle. Therefore, since we've got to make the switch from oil anyway, why not do it now, while we've got an electricity grid that works 24 hours a day to work by, while we have cash from the energy windfall of the 70s to invest in renewables and in changing the whole shape of everything? Or we can spend this money sending battleships out to capture the dwindling deposits of the last hours of ancient sunlight. But to make the switch from oil now would take a World War II collective effort on behalf of the citizenry would mean, for once in our lives, getting off our asses and doing something. Us, not politicians, us. Now, when I first started getting involved with radical, direct action, non-hierarchical, eco-autonomous, grassroots organizations, I didn't understand the concept of no leaders. I thought I did, but I didn't. And I got to the nearest alpha male or alpha female and say, here's what you should be doing. Why don't you do this? It'd be great if you all did this. Be, when, when are you going to do this? And they give me this look that I never understood, which was kind of... 
I think, weird, I'm up to the next alpha. When are you going to do this? It'd be great if you did this. Why, why, why haven't you done this yet? Yeah, but when are you going to do it? It'd be wonderful. Why, why won't you do this? And again, I get, they'll give me this look, like... <laughs> and I, I've got a year, the penny dropped, and I finally realised what that look meant, because they won't tell you, because that would be high.